Uh, God, we're very thankful for all your blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to study the Bible. Uh, particularly, uh, we're thankful for this opportunity to study uh, the Thessalonian letters. We thank you for the Apostle Paul and all the work he did uh, back in the first century and for all the letters he wrote. And we're thankful that uh, these, of course, Father, are part of your word. And we're thankful for all the blessings we can receive uh, when, we, when we look at your word, when we, when we study it. Father, uh, bless us this morning as we do just that. And uh, Father, for those of us who have worshiped and those of us who will worship in a little bit, we thank you for that opportunity, of course, on every Lord's Day and bless us in our worship today as well. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good to see everybody here this morning. And we are continuing, obviously, with the Thessalonian letters, as you can see. And we're finishing up chapter uh, 2. Uh, so we'll be looking at verses 13 to 20. We looked at verses 1 through 12. Last week, uh, the idea that the, the people knew Paul. They, they had good knowledge of him. They knew uh, what he was about. They knew his motives. They knew uh, the different things that, that he wanted to um, uh, preach and motivate in them, in the Thessalonians. And even though, from our perspective, he was just there for a short time, he was able to do uh, a lot of great things. You know, he didn't spend two and a half years there like he did in some places, um, but uh, he was there for three Sabbaths at least before things started getting all riled up. And so he was able to do good work and they knew again what he was about and what he wanted. Um, as we uh, move through the, the quarter, as you can see, we're on week four. And again, we'll finish up chapter two uh, today. So as far as the... Um, Introduction goes, a lot of great passages that uh, Chad Ramsey included in the booklet as far as introductory passages, introductory thoughts to what Paul would be talking about in these verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so I'm going to share uh, some of those uh, with you all. Uh, Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And of course, this is what Paul was doing on these missionary journeys. He would first go to the Jews. He would head to the synagogues to try to help them realize that this Messiah you've been talking about and reading about and hearing about uh, for your whole life from these Old Testament scriptures, uh, that was Jesus. And do you believe in him? And Paul was not ashamed, even though it took Paul a while to, to have his own conversion. Um, he... Um, was not ashamed of the gospel. He wanted them to make the same choice. A lot of times they did. Um, a lot of times, like in Thessalonica, there'd be some jealous Jews, and they would um, uh, not believe that Jesus was the Christ. They would not believe Jesus is the Messiah, and they would cause trouble. And in Thessalonica, of course, they caused a lot of trouble, drove him out of the city. So, but Paul was not ashamed. And after he would go to the Jews, he would then go to the Gentiles in these places and preach the gospel. And of course, tons of people uh, came to Christ because of what he was willing to do. Um, the gospel, the good news, is the power for salvation. It is power, it is God's power. It is the way in which uh, we are saved. We are saved by grace through faith, uh, which actually we'll be looking at, shameless plug for tonight's uh, sermon uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter two. All right. Um, in 1 Thess, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, he further defines the, the gospel, as, as Greg did for us a couple uh, Sunday nights ago, I believe, uh, very vividly. Uh, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So very specifically, this is, the, the gospel is the good news, and it's used kind of generally, but when we look at really what is being talked about with the gospel, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul points that out very clearly here in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Uh, Greg used the term, and I liked it, he, he, he used the term uh, uh, throwaway word, um, and sometimes we dilute religious words to the point that they become throwaways. And uh, we don't want that, of course, to happen with the gospel, even though in the religious world and maybe in society, it kind of has. Um, as Greg said, the gospel truth, you know, people don't really know what they're talking about when they say that. They just mean that's really true. And uh, so 
we, we want to make sure we stick with the Bible's way of, of doing things. 2 Corinthians 5.17, uh, further, another passage uh, Chad used in that intro. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And these are, these are all writings of Paul uh, showing his emphasis and, and his direction when he talks about the gospel, when he talks about conversion. And, of course, this is uh, once the conversion takes place, once someone comes to Christ, then that person is a new creation. That person uh, comes up from the waters of baptism, a, a person who is now part of the church, a person who has now received the Holy Spirit, a person who has been transformed. And as we said with our James class uh, Wednesday night, uh, the person has been saved, the person is being saved, the person will be saved in the next life uh, in a more complete, um, total, perfected uh, way when Christ comes back again. So all these things are uh, true and biblical ways to talk about salvation and being a new creation. In this context, um, we became a new creature when we came up out of the waters of baptism. We are continuing to become this new creation. And then, of course, we will be glorified. It'll be complete uh, when we head into heaven. And uh, just beautiful, beautiful thoughts that we have in Scripture. And then back to uh, a couple weeks ago. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So uh, on this idea of conversion and this introductory kind of way, we, we're, we're continuing to realize that uh, this conversion, the conversion that a Christian goes through uh, from uh, darkness to the kingdom of light, this, this conversion um, uh, has end results. It has, uh, we, we don't call them consequences because they're not negative, but uh, they have results. Uh, the conversion means that there's a future reality uh, for us. And they made that real in Thessalonica. They had been worshiping idols. They had been involved in a lot of the pagan things that people were involved in back in the first century, and they were willing to change. They really made a transition from that to the living and true God. And uh, we talked about waiting uh, uh, during that week. So um, any, any comments anyone wants to make or anything that made anyone think of before we uh, move into today's text? Okay, all right. So, receiving the word, and this is just one verse here uh, that, uh, as the booklet divides us. And by the way, if you if you don't have a booklet, they are on the shelves in the lobby. And if you're online and you don't have a booklet, um, you can. We'll get one to you. So, all right. So, receiving the word, First Thessalonians two thirteen. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so when we are thinking about our brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it's someone here at Fishinger and Kenny or someone at another congregation, when we think about someone who has been converted, someone who has come to Christ, uh, we, can, we can do what Paul would do. We can thank God constantly for this. Uh, when we, uh, I still flip through a physical bulletin. I know most of you are way more savvy uh, than I, and you probably use the, the directory on your phone, or that's what I meant to say, directory, not bulletin. Um, but I still, I still flip through one of the old directories that Amy uh, printed out uh, near the last time we had new members or someone baptized. And, um, you know, and that's what I use. And I probably need to occasionally focus my prayer more on exactly what Paul's saying here, that I'm always thankful for new Christians. I'm always thankful for people's faith, but maybe I need to pray, you know, God, I'm thankful that this individual received the word and received it for what it really is, received it knowing that it wasn't a word from man, but the truth but the true and living God's word. 
that it's that God himself, that they accepted it for what it really is, the word of God. And of course, that, that's a little convoluted the way I just said it. But, but that should be something not only that we thank God for, but that we encourage. Uh, because we, we definitely live in a time where people don't want to believe something's true. Or they want to believe that there are a multitude of truths. And whatever someone picks as their truth is fine. And so possibly the prayer could be adapted for 2021 to be, you know, God, I thank you that this person has come to Christ. And I pray that this person will continue to realize that it's your word, that it's not something that was made up by human beings, but God, that it's yours and it's true and it's real. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, Paul is thankful and he thanks God constantly for this, that when they, the, Thessalon the Thessalonians received the word of God, uh, and notice they did hear it from human beings. Human beings are the people who proclaim it. We, we are the ones who uh, get it out there. We're the ones who communicate it. Um, and, but they realized that it was not a word from man, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Um, I liked this quote, um, and I haven't done many quotes from the booklet uh, this quarter. In fact, this is the first time. Um, here in week four, but um, uh, David Lipscomb and J.W. Shepard uh, wrote a commentary. Um, I believe these are the, is this the Gospel Advocate commentary? Okay, it would make sense. <laughs> so anyway, but I liked how they lumped all this, a lot of this together, and Chad did it in his introduction as well. But they say, uh, the Word of God is described as living and active. By it, the new birth is affected, the soul saved. We looked at that passage this past Wednesday night in James sanctified and edified it bears fruit and increases throughout the world and grows and prevails mightily like the seed the word of god bears its life power within itself hence its manifold activities and its boundless increase it is compared with fire against that which is false and with a hammer against that which is strong it is light in the midst of darkness and it is the sole weapon in the Christian's warfare. Um, uh, Josh Ball will be preaching about Ephesians 6 uh, near the end of the quarter, um, uh, March, in May, uh, maybe the next to last uh, lesson on Sunday nights um, in Ephesians 6. So anyway, but I loved the way that all this was put together so uh, succinctly. And, um, and I would say that the reason God's word has power is that it's God's word, it's from God. And that's why the word of God has the power that it has. That's why it can transform lives. That's why if someone's kind of down, if someone's, um, uh, as Josh talked about this morning, maybe uh, um, hasn't had the, the social side of life as much as one might have wished in the last uh, year, um, that's why you can take someone who's in that kind of state and say, you know what, just read, read these five verses today and read these five or 10 tomorrow and read this the next day. That's why it will change their lives. That's why it can pull someone out of, I'm not talking about clinical or, you know, that kind of depression, but you know, the blues, that's why it can pull someone up from the muck because it's God's revelation. It's God's word. And so that obviously, and of course, Lipscomb and Shepard know that, uh, but that's important for us to realize. Why, why do these words have power and maybe something else doesn't? Well, it's because of the source. And that's why the word is able to pull someone from darkness to light. That's why it's able to do all these things uh, that they pulled from various scriptures. Because it is God's proclamation. It's his revelation. It's, it's what he wants for us. And, and of course, God knows what's best for us too. It's not random with God. He knows exactly what will pull us in to the right direction. All right, so um, a couple things I just wanted to make sure I highlighted, um, well, literally did, but wanted to make sure uh, with you all. Um, it is the word of God. Um, and they understood this proclamation that Paul and his associates made, they understood it for what it really was. And that is the word of God and it works. In believers. Uh, it is at work in those of you who believe. 
um, particularly here the Thessalonians, but of course, obviously, in all of us as well. So any, any thoughts or uh, comments about that one verse, just uh, chapter, verse 13, um, that, uh, that Paul Gartman had said in a class or in a sermon some, at some point had said, you know, instead of, if you're trying to, if you're talking with a non-Christian, someone who doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God, then, then keep emphasizing, say, instead of saying, you know, let's see what the Bible has to say, because they may not have any elevated feeling toward that particular book, but say, um, let's hear what God has to say through the Apostle Paul or through Luke or, or whoever it might happen to be. And uh, I think that's, that's really good because it emphasizes the fact that, that it is God's. And that's, again, that's why we can rely on it. That, that's all the things, that's why, because it is, I don't want to say, and it's, well, maybe it's fair to say that it's an extension of who God is. Um, obviously, um, it, the Bible is not God, but it's his revelation. It is, it is his word, and that's why we call it, uh, call it such. All right, so um, suffering in verses uh, 14 through 16 here. Uh, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and, and displeased God and opposed and kind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. And so he's going to point out a couple things here. Um, I highlighted the first part that they were persecuted by their own countrymen, um, as they, the ones in Judea, did from the Jews. And so they, they dealt with suffering from within, so to speak. And this is, this is part of what happened in Thessalonica to drive Paul out um, it made them run to Berea uh, because they were upset. They were envious. They were jealous. They, they didn't like uh, what was being proclaimed. Um, it's, a, it's amazing how many times people in the New Testament are motivated uh, from jealousy or envy and how many times that, that comes through uh, in the word. And the people here were. There, there definitely was, and, and maybe some of you have been around people uh, that kind of have a power hunger Um, and probably more in the business world, I would think. And I just haven't been exposed to people motivated uh, by that uh, in my life, really. Uh, But we see a lot of it here in the New Testament. I think probably you all see a lot of it too um, in your lives, depending on your setting. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of a scary thing. Um, You know, people just wanting stuff just for the sake of of attention or, or just for the sake of wanting stuff. And uh, the people here, they just did not like this um, at all. And notice, uh, well, let me, uh, let me take you back to Acts 17 uh, real quick, uh, just three verses here, five, six, and seven, uh, to show uh, what we already looked at in week one. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And so, again, this is what caused Paul and his companions to have to run, run off to Berea. And so uh, there was trouble. There was this internal uh, struggle there in Thessalonica. Uh, notice the, and, and one uh, commentator um, was talking about these verses, that this might be the strongest language that Paul uses concerning um, the, the Jews, uh, the ones who did not accept Christ. Uh, this might be the, the strongest little bit of uh, accusation and, um, and uh, negative uh, sayings uh, toward these people that Paul uses in all his letters and all his writings. So I, I don't know if that's true. Um, I know Paul uses very strong language in, in Galatians concerning those who want to change the gospel, but that's a little bit different. So this might be, uh, this might be appropriate, um, that this might be the strongest uh, language here. But anyway, notice, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and... <laughs> 
displease God and oppose all mankind. I mean, that's pretty intense. It really is very strong and, and very all-inclusive. Yeah, Bill. Yes, yes, you're right. And Bill mentioned Paul putting himself right in the middle of that bucket in some places. And also, um, and I, now I can't remember if it's today or uh, tonight or Wednesday night, <laughs> but we also see uh, in Scripture that God, I mean, that Paul loves the Jews. He loves them. He wants them to be saved so badly. And so, you know, Paul, just all these different emotions. But He's obviously, he was driven out of Thessalonica. He was driven to Berea. Uh, there, there, I mean, there's no untruth in this at all, but definitely his emotions would be running high concerning what happened there. And, you know, so, so here we go. They killed the Lord Jesus. They killed the prophets. They drove us out and they displeased God and oppose all mankind. I mean, that's very, very uh, intel. Oh, it's, it's right here. Um, but Paul does love the Jews. <laughs> I am speaking the truth in Christ, Romans 9, 1 through 5. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And so, yes, all this, as, as Bill was saying, and as the scriptures have shown, you know, Paul is definitely you know, I, I wouldn't say conflicted, it's all true, uh, but, but on the emotional side, definitely he loves them, wants them to be saved. At the same time, he knows what they have done as a group, and particularly the Jews in Thessalonica. Uh, so, you know, from our perspective, maybe a little bit of a struggle from Paul's, of course, you know, not. These things are just, they're all the truth, but he wants, he wants these people to be saved, that's for sure. Yeah, George, George. Um, uh, for those of you online and those of you any, even in here that may not have heard, just um, George pointed out that, that Paul, you can love people, but you still have to draw your line. And George said it better. But, but Paul did that. Jesus did that. And George brings up the fact that, you know, people were starting to get hurt and not just hurt as in, you know, hey, we were thrown in prison for a few days or this, that or the other. Uh, you know, these people were hindering people from seeing the Lord Jesus from being saved from they, they were affecting them uh, uh, from an eternal standpoint and you know there there are a few things you know Jesus uh, uh, would come down hard on and uh, one uh, was of course hypocrisy and uh, just read uh, Matthew 25 and how he came down on the Pharisees Sadducees teachers of the law you hypocrites you know he he Jesus you know uh, definitely was willing to put it out there. Did it, does it mean that he didn't love them? Well, of course it doesn't mean that. He did love them. He wanted them to believe in him. He wanted them uh, to be saved uh, in the end. But but they were, you know, they, it was unacceptable. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Jerry was saying that um, that people so emphasize the flesh. They so emphasize the physical uh, side of life. Um, yeah, even today, of course, and uh, to, to a great extent. And in this passage, of course, Romans 9, um, uh, we, we see what Paul's doing concerning his kinsmen. Of course, he wants them to be saved. There's nothing wrong with that. But we've see, we see people today emphasizing all these physical things over the spiritual. And it's what the spiritual is what's important. The, um, this kind of thinking got out of control in the second century. We call it Gnosticism. You can Google that and read a little bit about that if you want. Um, it's, it's believed that the Colossians were moving into that kind of mindset where there was a total separation, which of course we, we don't want to do. We want to be the right kind of people. We want to emphasize the spiritual. And at the same time, we realize that we are, we are whole beings. Um, that what the, the, the heresy was that people would say, um, well, since it's the spiritual that matters, I can do anything I want in the flesh. And of course, Jerry, you weren't saying that. And, and Paul's not saying that. Um, but, 
you know, the truth of the matter is we are whole individuals. So we get the mind right, we get the spirit right, and, and then the outward manifestations of those things uh, in the flesh, our speech, our actions, all those things will, will comply um, with that. So, but anyway, great, and, and thank you for all those. Thanks, George, as well. So, any other uh, comments before? Yeah, yeah. Um, Stuart, I'm not going to try to repeat everything, Stuart. Uh, <laughs> but Stuart, the first thing Stuart said was uh, familiarity uh, breeds contempt. And, um, and that's probably, like Bill was saying, Paul throws himself in the same bucket. Um, and so he, there probably was a little bit of that. You know, he, he, he knows the thinking. He knows the way that they're doing things. And then the other thing that Stuart uh, brought up is that um, the, the people, especially the ones against Jesus, were, were just nitpicking through stuff. And, and we don't, you know, sometimes we just need to back off and say, okay, God said to do this. We just need to do it as, a, as opposed to trying to uh, dissect it into a million pieces and, and figure that out. And, and he was mentioning that's part of what uh, the Pharisees and, and others had done. They had taken the law and then they had added all this stuff to it, um, which was, you know, uh, inappropriate. And Jesus would point that out, uh, that they had, uh, that, 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 well, for example, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath and, and things like that. So we appreciate that. Uh, all right. So, um, Notice that they're, they're displeasing God and they're opposing all mankind. Um, they did this by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Really what George was getting at. Um, they, were, they were stopping the gospel from bring, being proclaimed. And therefore, they were stopping people from being saved. Um, and of course, you know, terrible. And so as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, the wrath has come upon them at last. And so um, a little bit of, uh, Greg, you probably like this little part of impre imprecation here at the end. <laughs> Greg, we did a study of the Psalms, and he did a lot of the um, imprecatory Psalms. And, uh, but anyway, a little bit of that here. You know, Paul's a little bit, you know, glad that there's some justice uh, taking place. That, that does not take away from the fact that, of course, in the end, he would have wanted them to be saved. But, but someone outside of Christ, uh, you know, there's... Uh, there's no salvation there. Um, okay, so finally, verses 17 through 20, uh, uh, the longing uh, section here. Uh, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. And so Paul points out his great desire to be with them, to get back to Thessalonica. Uh, this was often the case. Sometimes he was able to make it back to towns or cities that he had visited, sometimes not. Uh, but in this case, he wanted to, wanted to. Uh, he even says, I again and again but hindered. And uh, the, the word there, um, I, I forget what some of the other translations say, but it's a strong Greek word. Um, it's, it's Satan, you know, actually blocking. Maybe that was the, the idea in some of the, in the Greek word. Uh, he blocked it from happening. He, it was, there was a wall put up that hindered, that kept Paul uh, from going. And it's interesting, and I, I thought about, there were just uh, too many but when you read through the book of Acts, uh, notice, and, and you could probably, I don't know if you could do that. In an Just next time you read through the book of Acts, notice how many times uh, the Spirit told us this, or the Spirit led us here, or the Spirit told us to go such and such a place, and Satan um, also being involved. There, there's definitely in, in the New Testament, and, and definitely with Paul here and in other places, this acknowledgement that there is spiritual warfare going on. And, you know, that, again, it's an emphasis on uh, the things going on kind of from our, well, I was going to say behind the scenes. Those things are behind the scenes, but we have been given revelation. We've been told that they're going on. So they're not as behind the scenes as they would be for a non-Christian, but they're still behind the scenes. We don't see it happening with our eyes. We don't, you know, we don't in any physical way, um, um, or even in the mind, we don't, you know, in any physical way, we don't 
see this or hear this happening, but we know it's happening because of what we read again in the word, God's word. And so we know that there's battle happening and we know the things that we can put on uh, to help ourselves uh, in that or allow God to help us in those things. Uh, but read through Acts with that mindset sometime. Uh, just take, take an hour or two and do that. And uh, it's, it's extremely interesting. And here, uh, Paul says, Satan hindered us. So he, he put the blame where it belongs. Uh, you'll recall in James, uh, a couple Wednesdays ago, we talked about trials and temptations. And James points out, you know, God cannot be tempted and God does not tempt you. You know, Paul puts the blame where it belongs. And that is on, uh, on Satan. So um, let me see here. So any, any comments about that before we uh, move on there? Okay, all right. So let's look at our applications. And uh, uh, the, the booklet has applications, questions, and discussion questions um, uh, for this setting, kind of combining the online and, and in here. I'm just putting the applications in here. Uh, but in your booklets... Um, uh, definitely. And Jerry, grab a booklet. I, I know that's your first time in the class. They're in the back on the shelves. You can get that in the lobby. You, well, after class, you can grab it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you can do it now, but, but anyway, so you, you'll see the questions, you'll see all the stuff. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, the applications are as follows, just two of them in here. I did put some of the scriptures uh, interspersed in uh, Chad's comments. Uh, the Thessalonians correctly recognize Paul's message as authoritative, uh, verse 13, he was not speaking for himself. He was speaking for God. Paul stressed the same point when he wrote to the Galatians. And then in the application, he quotes uh, Galatians 1, 11, and 12. For I, would have, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, this is why Paul uh, could be called an apostle. He he experienced the things that were necessary to be called an apostle. He had the direct um, uh, contact with, with Jesus, which was one of the uh, prerequisites uh, for, the, for the 12, then the 11, then the 12 again, and then adding Paul 13 um, apostles. And then in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And so Paul recognized and the Thessalonians recognized that, that, that Paul's authority came ultimately from uh, Jesus Christ. And that's uh, the next passage uh, quoted in the um, application, uh, picking up uh, where we left off. As an apostle of Christ, Paul spoke with divine authority to their credit, the Thessalonians received his message in an appropriate way and subsequently obeyed it. We must do no less. And I, I think that's great, uh, that motivation for us. So we receive the word. And then, as Stuart was saying, sometimes, you know, we may not like it. We may not want to be patient at a given time. We may not want to tell someone about Jesus at a certain time, you know, we, whether it's mood, whether it's fear, no matter what it is. But you know what? Sometimes we've received it. We're just supposed to do what it says. And so we just do it and fight through our own limitations, fight through our fears, whatever it might be. And then the second application, when explaining why he had not returned to Thessalonica, Paul revealed that he was hindered or blocked by Satan, uh, verse 18, because the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8, we must his efforts to hinder us as well. Uh, we do this by resisting him. And I'm pausing here because we have a class on resisting Satan this quarter. It is put on our YouTube channel every Monday night. David Mays is teaching that. And so, uh, again, a shameless plug for our edu adult education. Uh, but you can find that on YouTube and watch those lessons. He's, uh, the fourth one will be uploaded. Uh, well, it already is, but it's scheduled to be released tomorrow. And of course, um, uh, James has been quoted here a few times. Uh, that's our Wednesday night class. All right, I'll finish the, uh, uh, finish the application quote. So we do this by resisting him, uh, verse nine of this text and James four, verse seven. We do this by putting on the Christian armor. 
and I already plugged that uh, uh, at the end of uh, at the end of May. Uh, we'll have a lesson on Sunday night as we go through the book of Ephesians. We'll be near the end at that point. So anyway, um, any final uh, comments? Um, anything anyone wants to add here? Oh yeah, George, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was... I, I think, and, and Greg, I'll let you hop in if you want to on this. Um, I think it might be like some of the other comments being made in the section. There's a here and now aspect to it, um, but also a future aspect to it, is, is what I would say. That they are, that just the fact that they are not engaged in the reality of the gospel, just the, the very fact that they are not engaged in Jesus Christ is part of it. And then, of course, there will be the future. If they, if they never do come to Christ, there will be the future, just the personal. You know, they may not all live 20 more years or however much longer uh, to end up um, being around in AD 70. Um, but that's how I, and, and a couple others kind of worded it that way. They, people, it's funny when there's a kind of a difficult thing in a passage, a lot of the commentaries, they won't comment on it. <laughs> it's so, it's very frustrating, right? Those, those are the ones that we want them to talk about. But that's kind of the feel I had. Does that sound, I mean, is that, I mean, Greg, do you want to add anything to that? I think you're probably think about the entire purpose of Israel was to be the kingdom for the Messiah. And they were looking for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the work of John the Baptist was described in Malachi as turning the hearts of the fathers of the children to the father, less I strike them. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this, they had entered into a status of persons. Mm -hmm. Now the physical punishment of Rome was yet to come, but there were spiritual, a spiritual price to be paid mm -hmm. because they missed out on the Messiah. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and hopefully the microphone picked that up uh, for y'all. So, well, let's, any other comments or thoughts? Okay, well, let's, let's all pray together again. God, we're so grateful for all your blessings. We thank you that we um, have heard and received the gospel message. And Father, help us to, to continue to share that with others. Help us to uh, really desire, as Paul did, uh, for people to be saved and help us to follow his example and the Thessalonians' uh, example. Father, uh, continue to bless us as we go through this letter and Second Thessalonians as well. Um, and again, if, if we've already worshipped, uh, we thank you for that. And those who are going to worship in the next hour, uh, please please bless all of us uh, with, a, with a good hour of worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good to see you next week. As you can see, uh, Concern and Conflict. We'll dive into chapter three.